It is well known that gold hunting may be quite profitable. However, when miners gain skill and travel deeper, they find various materials in addition to gold, some of which are as valuable as actual gold and others of which are as worthless as metal scraps. What occurs when gold miners find objects unrelated to gold by accident? If they discovered something worth more than gold, how would they respond? Join us as we explore Parker Schnabel's unusual discovery as he discovers mammoth tusks on his gold quest. Parker Schnabel is no stranger to getting his hands filthy and down on the ground during his pursuit of wealth. As a teenager, he began working on the family mine in the first season. Since assuming control of the family mines in the second season, the young guy has continuously been among the most prosperous gold miners. Schnabel appears to have the Mivas touch, bringing in thousands of ounces of gold each season, which translates into hundreds of thousands of dollars for his crew to keep, while other mining CEOs sometimes struggle. Parker, who has made eight appearances on Gold Rush, has amassed an estimated $10 million fortune for himself, and he has no intention of slowing down. The miner disclosed that throughout his explorations, he had discovered several other peculiar items in addition to gold. Let's just say that a lot of material is buried beneath the surface of the earth. It's possible that miners have discovered odd objects throughout their trips amid all the digging and excavating. Parker discovers something that might easily make many archaeologists happy, so forget about gold. In an interview with the Maelstrom, he revealed the peculiar find he discovered during his gold mining expedition, discussing what is possibly the most expensive item he possessed that wasn't gold. What was remarkable, he added, was that he had discovered a pair of woolly mammoth tusks that had been preserved. Because the tusks are made of ivory and were buried in the permafrost, which protected them from the harsh weather, they are incredibly well preserved. Despite the woolly mammoth's extinction thousands of years ago, some survived in perfect shape. The finding of fossilized remnants serves as a reminder of what constitutes a creature. Mammography tusks are not wholly unusual to find in Alaska. They are highly valuable and support a booming industry. These tusks have an enormous value when they're in good condition because they're made of ivory. Each one can command a price that souls to and surpasses $1 million. Mammoth tusks are among the most precious discoveries, even though Parker and his colleagues on Gold Rush might not find anything that is worth more than gold. Let's just say that given that there are people out there who will buy almost anything, the mammoth tusks he discovered would be worth a respectable sum. Schnobel admits that he would not sell the tusks despite their possible value and worth. He decides not to go through the process of obtaining the necessary approvals in order to sell items like that. Rather, he views the tusks differently and would rather keep them. He believes they're so amazing and ought to be kept instead of being sold. Furthermore, it is impossible to hold him accountable. Keeping the odd finds along the road makes logical. He already makes hundreds of thousands of dollars from the gold he discovers particularly when he can confidently claim to be the possessor of well-preserved mammoth tusks. It is therefore not surprising if you happen to find yourself in Parker Schnabel's home and some enormous mammoth tusks are waiting for you. Parker made a wise professional choice and the mammoth tusks are the cherry on top. More discoveries are likely in store for him, as there is no sign that he will call it quits on his profession anytime soon. It appears like the hunt for an uncommon treasure on Gold Rush is not ended yet, since one of the show's main characters, a legendary gold miner, found something really amazing. At his new location in Paradise Hills, Tony Beats made an unexpected but important discovery related to the Gold Rush. Instead of the typical Gold Rush, he found a tusk with unusual meaning for this region of Alaska. While visiting the site, he saw the tusk sticking out of the earth. With the aid of his son Mike and their equipment, they were able to successfully excavate the find, which Mike initially mistook for a jawbone. Tony made the decision to have paleontologists take a careful look at it. Experts surmise 
that the woolly mammoth skeleton discovered earlier could belong to the same family as the tusks discovered during the gold rush. Since the Klondike gold rushed more than a century ago, miners have continued to find these kinds of bones. The Yukon region is particularly well known for its history of finding animals from the Ice Age. People were reminded of the woolly mammoth despite Tony's statement that he had previously discovered horse and zebra remains. The baby mammogram is thought to be at least 30,000 years old, according to Gold Rush, and the area's icy conditions and terrain are responsible for the preservation of ice period species. There were other unusual sites during the Gold Rush besides mammoth tusks. The god the miners set out to locate is not the only entity they have encountered. Parker, in particular, had an encounter with something that completely stunned him. Face to face with the welcome stranger replica Parker Schnabel was shocked to see the biggest gold nugget ever discovered as he came face to face with the relic of welcome stranger. As he sought new experiences and chances, we saw that he was half a world away from the Klondike Gold Rush Trail in Season 4, Episode 2, Installment of Gold Rush, Parker's Trail. The episode opened with fourth-generation Australian gold prospector Tyler Mahoney greeting Parker and his partner Fred Lewis. She opened her truck door and showed them the two-foot-long golden boulder that was positioned across the back seat. Legend has it that the welcome stranger had to be shattered into three pieces on an anvil in order for it to fit on a bank scale. The nugget would be worth about $4.7 million based on the current rate of which holds are sold. Two exact duplicates of the original Welcome Stranger survive today, while the original was long since melted down into gold bars. The descendants of Deason own and possess one, while the second is on exhibit at Melbourne's old treasury building. It is believed that the one taken from Mahoney's truck is the Deason family member. An obelisk commemorating the Nugget's finding site in Moliagal was built in 1897. Parker and other contemporary gold miners were not the ones who discovered it, so who made this incredible finding that had even Parker in disbelief? Thousands of individuals joined the Victorian gold rush in the 1850s, heading to Victoria, Australia, in the hopes of striking it rich. They traveled from all around Australia, as well as other countries. The bliss didn't last very long. While a small percentage of people won big and were wealthy for life, most people never experienced enormous fortune. On February 5, 1869, however, fortune did indeed call for two Cornish miners. John Deason was born in Tresco in the Isles of Scilly, but following the death of his father, a fisherman at the age of one, the family relocated to Pendine in West Cornwall. This is when he met Richard Oates, his future partner, and the two of them are listed as employed in Cornwall's tin mines in the 1851 census. In 1853, Mr. Deason left for Australia, and a year later, Mr. Oates came to start a career as a gold prospector. After seven years of eking out a life when they first arrived in Moliagal in 1862, the two men struck gold. The discovery that made them famous was a miracle on a slope known as Bulldog Gully. Just below the surface was a massive chunk of gold embedded in quartz. Because of its size, Mr. Deason claimed that when he attempted to use the pick to pick up the nugget, the handle snapped. Afterwards, he lifted the nugget to the surface with a crowbar. They transported it to Dunnerley, a distance of roughly 12 miles, where the London Chartered Bank weighed it. The nugget was too big for the scales to model or photograph, therefore it was broken up right away. Based on the recollections of individuals who witnessed it, a drawing was created and a duplicate is currently kept hidden in the Dunali Museum. Significant finds are still being made by miners in gold-rich locations. Parker Schnabel has established himself as a formidable competitor. Let's review his incredible adventure in brief. In Gold Rush's Electrifying Nugget Season 10, Parker had to navigate a world full with fresh allegations and cutting-edge technical developments. A significant event occurred in the middle of the mining frenzy, the finding of the electric nugget. 
Fans of Gold Rush, as well as Parker and his team were electrified with enthusiasm at this uncommon and unique discovery. When Parker started his hunt, the excitement for bigger discoveries peaked because he intended to transport and extend his activities throughout the Klondike and Scribner Creek. The 41.8-ounce electric nugget got its name from an intriguing dendritic crystal structure that resembled lightning bolts. The nugget's unique characteristic elevates its intrinsic gold value by differentiating it from earlier discoveries and establishing it as a rare geological marvel. As the season went on, Million Dollar Payday, Episode 15, emerged as a serious candidate to feature the explosive nugget. In the end, Parker's hold mining legend gains a stunning new chapter with the explosive nugget. Because of its distinctive crystalline beauty and rarity, its market value is higher. Its status as a noteworthy and significant discovery of the gold rush is unquestionable. Parker set out on a risky journey in Season 7 of Gold Rush, which featured the Eureka Creek bounty. He encountered the harsh realities of the mining industry amid a litany of obstacles, ranging from dealing with equipment failure to unstable hold yields and the perils of uncharted territory. Despite this, he remained unfazed. He made investments in state-of-the-art technology developments and adjusted his operations to meet his difficulties and achieve a significant improvement. A stunning change occurred in the middle of the season, and spectators saw how Parker's work at Eureka Creeks started to pay off. Following was an extended period of remarkable gold recovery, hence the nickname Eureka Creek Bounty. Episodes such as Eureka Payday and King Knopf Klondike served as this bounty's climax. Parker routinely surpassed his prior hauls and the expectations of his admirers by recovering huge amounts of gold. The team's celebration of the results of their combined dedication and hard work was filled with unbridled excitement. What distinguishes the Eureka Creek bounty from the others is its significance as a turning moment. Parker's leadership in the cutthroat world of gold mining was cemented by his steady recovery of gold in the region. His operations were able to grow to other locations, and he was able to invest in better equipment and more modern technologies due to his consistent success. Even with all the gold Parker has discovered, he nevertheless suffers losses. Since he began working as a miner at the age of 16, he has suffered considerable losses. Let's look at a few of the losses he has had. Historic $3 million loss. Parker and his crew banked 108 ounces from tailings left by historic gold miners in Alaska after investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in that region. The actual cherry on top, though, was a spot known as the Wolf Cut, a virgin ground with an estimated gold content of over 2,000 ounces and a market value of over $3 million. In terms of the information it received, this wolf cut is so significant that it has been named the most significant pit of the season. Parker's group needed two months to reach the pay layer of the cut because the location is so deep. However, things don't always go as expected. That was the crew's predicament. The wolf had become a lake due to a destructive flood that occurred a few weeks prior. Parker said, that it would have been preferable to take all the money to Vegas rather than drown in the flooded wolf cut because of how problematic it was. However, Parker, who was renowned for his persistence, refused to merely cede the space. After some effort, the crew was able to drive back the water, and at last the operations foreman, Mark Falls, arrived to lay the groundwork. Parker was going to have to see whether there was enough gold to make them take a chance. He cleared some dirt in one spot, but it could have been more spectacular. He eventually discovered some fine dirt in another section of the cut, suggesting that there was gold nearby. Parker made the decision to go work with the team and come back in two days. But just when it looked like everything was going according to plan, and they were going to find some gold, the group as a whole was taken aback by something. Mud and water were streaming out of a hole that had been blasted into the wall. It was clear that day, nature was not entirely in their favor. 
the water they had believed to be effectively eradicated have returned stronger and more dangerous than it had been in the past. The crew was not prepared for this to occur. They risked suffering a significant loss if the wolf cut was to get infected once more. An excavator struck the pit's side while working for pay at the bottom of the cut, revealing a mine shaft that was flooded with water. This caused millions of gallons of water to spill back into the pit, covering the pay grounds. The crew was not unprepared, rather, their level of preparation was lacking. Although they had one 8-inch pump already, additional was required to deal with the water. Although the second pump was turned on by the team, not much changed. There was still water seeping in from all sides. The crew's battle against the water was lost once they fired their two pumps. Removing the wash plant's pump was their only choice. However, Parker was in a position to make that call because it was such an important decision. The issue was that he was neither there nor responding to his phone. They were in a difficult situation. The entire area would flood and they would forfeit their wolf cut money if they didn't remove the wash plant pump to sustain the other two pumps. The magnitude of the loss would be astounding. Tyler took the difficult decision to turn off the wash plant's pump and quadruple their capacity to drain. All they could do was vacate the area and let the pumps do their work. In a single day, the pumps extracted 10 million gallons of water. When Parker did return, he was really excited to see the first cleanup of the wolf cut. Rather, tales concerning the flood that occurred were told to him. However, Parker's issue with water was far from over. He came into contact with water once more in an occasion where his mining area in the wolf cut was totally swamped. Submerged mining ground, Parker was hunting a four-acre wolf cut in his Alaskan claim hoping to catch a pay streak that would net him at least a thousand ounces this season. The team needed to remove 1,000 yards of overburden in order to reach the pay debt, which was located 30 feet below the surface. There were still four feet to descend to the water's surface and another 30 feet to reach bedrock. However, things weren't as good as they first appeared. Water would be the first to suffer if there were any issues because they were operating the operation adjacent to a pond. Perfect frozen mud was the answer since it kept the water out. John Beaudry, the recruit, had to deal with the mud and keep the water out. They needed to call in their boss because the cut appeared to be quite moist. If not, things might go out of control, which would not be good. They had not even reached a fifth of the cutout and it turned out that the more sections they opened, the worse the muck got and the faster it spread. The wolf cut is next to a pond that is rather old. The only thing between the two was a little mound that wouldn't hold up to any tampering with water pressure. The water was kept back by the frozen permafrost that the crew discovered when they delved further. Due to the impact on the permafrost, Pond water is now able to seep through the embankment and overflow the cut. If they let it continue, there will soon be a lot of water in the area. To save the day, something had to be done. Purchasing a pump seemed to be their best course of action. Parker intended to create a sunk pond at the lowest point of the cut and install an 8-inch pump to empty it as a countermeasure against the water. He was not going to lose another battle for water. They were forced to wait till the following day after the installation. Their strategy was feasible and effective overall. But how does one choose a pump to remove such a large amount of water from a pond without first making sure the pump functions properly and repairing any issues it may have? When the following day came, the entire group galloped outside to inspect their flawlessly dried and prepared for med wolf cut but they were about to receive a disagreeable shock. There was no sign of their pump. It appeared as though the pump had vanished, and instead of encountering a perfectly dried-up cut, they found themselves facing a lake. Their pump was submerged beneath four feet of water due to a catastrophic pump system failure that flooded the cut, a half a million bucks that would have easily escaped their grasp. They were unable to even walk up to the pump since it was totally submerged. 
In order to work on the pump, Tyson had to get a small kayak paddled out using a chain in the excavator. Mark Falls, the foreman, claims that dirt clogged the suction filter at the end of the hose, raising the water level and submerging the entire pump. Along with servicing and stripping the engine, he had to come up with a plan to prevent the pump from being harmed by any flooding. Parker has demonstrated that he is resilient and resilient enough to overcome several obstacles in his path. In spite of everything, he went on to do something that astounded fans and miners alike. Finishing a season with $14 million in gold Parker Schnabel and his group have embarked on a project that might just change the definition of what gold mining is all about. The stakes suddenly increased when winter hit its lowest point because every handful of soil had the power to either create or shatter their ambition. Soon after the season began, there was a feeling of urgency as Parker devoted all of his time to planning his team's search for the valuable substance. The severe weather in Alaska was not to be taken lightly. It tested their mental fortitude. But they faced the obstacles head-on, overcoming broken machinery and perilous terrain in search of their gold, all with an iron will. Parker had to use his leadership abilities, which he had developed over the years via failures and victories, to carefully plan each action as the group's leader. Expectations were high, but he didn't let them stop him. He led his team across the dangerous terrain, motivated by the idea that the Klondike contained the secret to a riches that would change everyone's life and, if discovered, render their problems unimportant. The excitement that swept through the mining camp upon the discovery of strategy and an enormous gold deposit, enough to save the season, was infectious. Thanks for watching my video.